Hey, thank you. Um, so, uh, conventionally, I would be thanking the organizers for inviting me, so I'd, <laughs> I'd like to thank my co-organizers for allowing me to speak. Um, I, I'm biased. I think this is a great meeting, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, and helping to make it a great meeting. Um, so, I'm going to talk about information content and molecular replacement, but in the trying to put it more in the context of the likelihood scores that you've been uh, hearing a bit about. So we're very keen on likelihood, as you may, might have gathered. Um, it's a probability-based optimization method where you, you can think of it as the, the likelihood is the probability of having measured the data set that you did measure, given a model that explains the data. So the better that you could have predicted the data from the model if you'd had a model before the data, the better the, the model is. And this is playing a more central role as time goes on in crystallography with experimental phasing, including SHARP and other programs, and molecular replacement and structure refinement. And so I'm going to be talking about molecular replacement, but basically at the end of molecular replacement, the likelihood target is the same as in structure refinement. So what I'm saying will apply as well to structure refinement. Um, information. Uh, part of what I want to tell you about is that this is a statistical concept that's related to likelihood. Uh, and what I'll hope to be able to show you very briefly is that if you calculate the information content of a data set, that that actually gives you an upper bound for the likelihood score that you would be able to achieve with that data set if you had a perfect model. Okay, so a likelihood um, gets its power from the fact that it accounts explicitly for the uh, statistical effective errors. So in the old Patterson-based methods for um, doing molecular replacement, um, they, there was no way in that framework of accounting for errors, and so you had all sorts of uh, arbitrary things you had to do. But uh, likelihood accounts for uh, an important part being errors in the model, as Koshik was saying. Uh, and this is especially important if you have poor models and well-measured data, so that the errors in fitting the data come from the model. Uh, but uh, the talk today is going to concentrate more on the other side of things, the errors in the data. And of course, our measured diffraction data have errors. Uh, that We're counting photons, so there are random counting errors. And as you get to weaker intensities, those become more significant. But we also have errors from processing the data by scaling it and whatever, and uh, effects like radiation damage that you can't always avoid. Now, this becomes more important when you have weak data. So if you have a crystal, it doesn't diffract very well. And uh, in particular, when you have a, a good model where you would like to be able to uh, compare that to the data to the very extremes of the resolution. Uh, so this becomes more important, for instance, if you're placing helices in Archimboldo or if you have a very accurate model at the end of refinement where what you're limited by is the quality of the data in terms of improving your model. Um, we account for the measurement error in phaser now in this LLGI target, the log likelihood gain on intensity, where we work in terms of intensities and the standard deviations of those intensities. Okay, log likelihood gain. So you've heard that. Why is it log likelihood gain? So the log part is because you take the logarithm of the likelihood. That's convenient computationally, but it also is uh, useful in terms of the property the, the log of the likelihood is, um, is better to work with than the likelihood for various reasons. The gain part is, uh, to put it on a scale where positive is good, the gain part is how much more do we know having uh, come up with a, a model compared to a null hypothesis when we didn't know anything. So in the case of uh, molecular replacement, what it's answering is a question, how much better can we predict the data from a model where there are atoms in certain places than just knowing that there are random atoms scattered around in the crystal. So uh, the log likelihood gain, we take the log of the likelihood, the probability of the data given the model, um, sum over all of the reflections, and for each of those, we subtract the log for a null hypothesis, the random atom model. And subtracting two logs is the same as taking the log of a ratio of probabilities. Uh, so uh, this is the log likelihood gain. We have a, the, the log of a ratio of probabilities. And there won't be a lot of formulas, but that's uh, a term that will be appearing in, in a number of them. 
Okay, so the LLG has uh, a great advantage in that it's an absolute score. So if you have uh, two models, the one with a higher LLG is a better model, and Raphael was using that in his uh, sequence slider. Um, but it also gives you a, a measure of the confidence in the solution. So Rob Erfner did this series of tests uh, where he looked at what fraction of molecular replacement trials actually succeeded in giving you, giving you a correct answer as a function of the LLG that was obtained in the molecular replacement search. You get this sharp transition, and by the time you get to an LLG of 60 or so, it's almost always right. And that doesn't matter uh, whether it's a big or a small structure, what the fold category is, and Koshik has uh, uh, reaffirmed that, that point about the fold category. The only thing that does make a bit of a difference is what space group you're in. So especially if you're in P1, where all you have to do is rotate around three angles to orient a model, and it doesn't matter where you translate it, uh, if you're only determining three degrees of freedom, then you can get away with less of a likelihood uh, improvement. Okay, so it's an absolute score, and the absolute number tells us something about whether we've solved the structure, but if we can predict what number we're going to get before we do the calculation, then we can uh, give some measure of how hard the problem will be or what way that we can use to solve the structure. And that's where the uh, expected log likelihood gain comes in. So you've heard a bit about... Uh, the ELLG, and basically we predict the LLG that should be achieved given what we think we know about the model. So uh, how complete is the model? What fraction of the scattering in the asymmetric unit does the model account for? Um, what's the quality of the model? So measured by this, this uh, predicted VRMS, and then the number of reflections because it's sum over reflections, and that depends uh, on the resolution of the data. And also, there's a, a question of the data quality. If we have well-measured data, we should get a higher LLG than if we have poorly measured data. Uh, to predict it, if it's an expected value, we have to av average over different possibilities. And what we're doing is averaging over all possible calculated structure factors that you would get consistent with uh, the expected mo model quality. So here's uh, another formula. This is the log likelihood gain. And then the averaging over all possible models is this probability here. And we uh, integrate over all of the possible models that you might have in terms of f-calcs or in calculated intensities. So as I said, this allows us to evaluate the chance of success and to tailor the search to the problem. So we know how small a domain can be that we can search for if we're searching for multiple fragments or whether we can search for a helix. Or if it's an easy problem, we know what resolution we need to use, as Erli mentioned. OK, so that's uh, likelihood. Let's switch to information. So uh, there's this question of measuring information content. And um, I like uh, what Keith Wilson uh, says about this. At some point, um, are you measuring data, or are you just measuring HKL indices? You know, so uh, if there's no spot there and you integrate over it, have you actually gained anything? So the, in terms of information, you say, how much more do we know about the true value of the intensity after making some measurement? And if there's no information in it, we haven't really in, increased our knowledge. So in, likely, in probability terms, what we're saying is how different is the posterior probability? So the posterior probability is what is the probability of the true intensity after you've made some intensity observation? which has been updated from the prior probability, which is the, uh, let's see, oh no, it's not in this slide, the, the Wilson uh, distribution. So that's the, another Wilson, that's Arthur Wilson, 1948. Uh, so the prior probability distribution, just knowing there are atoms in the crystal and they will add up to give some intensities. And uh, information content can be measured in, in information theory by something called the uh, callback leibler divergence or the KL divergence. Uh, but it, it's sort of a relative entropy. So this is a, a formula that, that looks a bit like an entropy formula. So this is how you express it. The callback leibler divergence in going from a prior to a posterior distribution is calculated with this integral, which looks in terms of the, numer the mathematical form like the one for the uh, expected LLG. If you do this calculation with a logarithm base 2, then you get a calculation that gives you information in bits, which is nice to understand. So uh, 
Uh, here's a simple example of how you can calculate this uh, for a pair of distributions. So let's take a situation where the prior distribution, there were two possibilities, both with some random error. If we do an experiment that tells us something about which of those is more likely than the other, then as we uh, gain more information, we will gradually go from the case where both of them were equally likely to one being eliminated and the other one being the only possibility that's left. And as we do that, as we go from uh, uh, the prior being equal to the posterior distribution, we go from zero information content to one bit of information. So it's like flipping a coin. Before you flip the coin, it could have been heads or tails with equal probability. You could call one of them zero and the other one one. Once you know, after flipping it, what it is, you've assigned that bit of information. So it's the same thing here. Okay, what about if we're measuring uh, diffraction data? So, uh, as I said, the prior probability of the true intensity is the Wilson distribution of normalized intensities. Um, and, you know, a minor technical point, this is different for the acentric reflections and the centric reflections, so the information measure will be a little bit different for those two. I'm only going to concentrate on the acentric ones that are the majority of our data in, crystallography, in macromolecular crystallography. Uh, but what's really important to say is that this is after we've accounted for any, st any statistical effects like anisotropy and TNCS, because the, the prior probability is changed when you have anisotropy or if you have translational NCS, because you know something about where the systematically strong and weak reflections will be before you even have a model or before you know the individual measurement for a particular reflection. The posterior probability then is just uh, the, um, you update the prior probability by the, what you learned from the intensity measurement and this was derived by French and Wilson, now this is Keith Wilson. Uh, and that's the basis of the truncate algorithm in, in CCP4 package and the same uh, kind of probabilities are used in the context of, of calculating this LLGI target. So that's one of the ingredients in that um, calculation of that target. Um, in what I'm going to show, I'm going to do this in the calculations defined in terms of a normalized intensity. So this is a, an intensity which has been normalized by dividing by the expected value of the intensity. That means the mean squared value, or the mean value of the intensity is 1, mean value v squared is one, but so that I don't have too many squares all over the place, I'm going to use the standard substitution that we replace e squared by z. So that's what z, z means, it's just the uh, normalized intensity. Okay, so here's uh, another kind of simulation showing how as we measure something more and more precisely, we gain information. So starting from, uh, so I'm starting from something with a very large standard deviation, uh, so five times the, the dot there starts out at five, five times the average intensity is the standard deviation of the intensity. That will hardly update the um, prior probability. So the blue and the orange curves almost exactly superimposed. There's very little information content, and you can see the information content is about 0 0.001 bit. But as you get more and more precise observations and the uh, posterior probability distribution gets sharper and sharper. The information content goes up until you've got, um, I don't know, five or six bits of information for very low um, standard deviations. Okay, so that's uh, looking at what happens as we change the standard deviation of the intensity. If we look at what happens as we change the actual intensity measurement that we make for a constant standard deviation, here's an example where we have a fairly precise observation where the standard deviation of the normalized intensity is about 0 0.2 and that would correspond to a case uh, where your average I over sigma is about 5. So that's pretty good data as you uh, change the intensity, the probability distribution uh, once you get away from 0 is pretty much Gaussian coming from your intensity measurement and the information content is on a scale you know, 0 to uh, well, numbers from 1 to 8 or so, and over the range where most intensities will occur, it's sort of 1 to 4. So that's kind of information content you get in that circumstance. But if we have a much weaker observation, so if the uh, 
uh, standard deviation of the normalized intensity is 5, which is like an I over sigma of 0 0.2 in that resolution shell, then the prior probability distribution changes shape a lot more when you, or the posterior po probability uh, differs much less from the prior probability. You've gained much less information. And if you look at it in terms of this KL divergence, we're looking at numbers that are like hundredths of a bit of information. So that's uh, kind of an illustration of, of what kind of numbers you see in different circumstances. Okay, so how is this uh, related to the um, ELLG? Well, as I mentioned, the equations have the same kind of a form. We have an integral of a probability times a ratio times a log of a ratio of probabilities in both cases for the ELLG and the KL divergence. And what I'm going to show you really quickly in the next slide is that if you use Bayes' theorem, you can turn the uh, ELLG equation into something which tells us that the um, ELLG for a perfect model would be the same thing as the KL divergence. So it is telling you what is the upper limit on the LLG that you could achieve. And most, what's important and that I want, it, want you to take away from this is that if you have an observation that has an extremely low value of information content, that it should have no significant influence on your likelihood-based calculation because the likelihood values should all be, the likelihood gains should all be zero no matter how good your model is for those observations. So they're not contributing anything or they shouldn't contribute anything. Okay, so to ignore most of the details, if we start from this equation for the ELLG and put in calculated and observed intensities, we've got this equation. Bayes' theorem tells us we can rearrange this so we can replace this ratio by this ratio by rearranging this equation. And if we say a perfect model will give us a calculated intensity that's equal to the true intensity, we can put in the true intensity here. And this is exactly the same equation as the KL divergence. So, um, so the information content really is equivalent to the ELLG for a perfect model, the best that we could possibly do. And that implies that then we can, once we've done the anisotropy correction and accounted for the ex effects of translational NCS, that means that we can then say, well, any reflection that looks like it has very low information content, uh, it doesn't matter whether we include it or not, but we might as well throw it away from the rest of the calculation because all it's going to do is waste computer time. So we can filter on bits of information that are carried by each observation. Now, um, there's two ways to do this, and we've implemented now both of them in phaser, and we're testing them out. What's uh, in the current version that's distributed is uh, something where we average over all possible values of the intensity that you would find with that standard deviation of the intensity. Uh, and that's because if you have an outlier, which is going to be more likely when you have a very uh, poorly measured uh, reflection, outliers look like they contain more information. So if you remember from that plot, as the intensity got larger, the information content rose up because that's a more surprising observation. You're finding a large intensity where you're expecting uh, the probability of a large intensity to be very low before you've made the, the measurement. So the expected information content is an average over all possible uh, values of the true intensity, uh, sorry, of the measured intensity, and that's based only on the standard deviation of the intensity. Uh, so and one benefit of that is that all you need is one cutoff value. Once you've uh, calculated the, you, you, you don't need to calculate an information content for each reflection. You can just say the standard deviation of the normalized intensity should be uh, greater should be less than some threshold value corresponding to a certain number of bits of information. So this is what the um, KL divergence formula, uh, the, uh, the expected value of the information content looks like as a function of the standard deviation of the normalized intensity. And once we get out to very large standard deviations, we're down around hundredths of a bit of information. And what we're using currently as the default in phaser is somewhere around 8.5 uh, for uh, a, for centri acentric reflections, which corresponds to 0 0.01 bit of information. Um, so standard deviations aren't measured, aren't estimated all that precisely. So if you had a different standard deviation from processing your data again, you'd get a different number. But basically, 
uh, when you're out here, if you change your standard deviation, you aren't changing, you aren't, look, it, it doesn't look like you have a lot more or a lot less information. If you go from 0 0.01 bit to 0 0.05 bit, it really doesn't change things very much. Okay, so where did this all come from? We were um, working on, we, we were helping um, Mustafa Jamshidiya and Ernesto Cota at Imperial College with the structure of RAB 27A. Uh, and ran into some problems in uh, doing molecular replacement with that because it has some exceptionally weak data. And it's relatively challenging in terms of the uh, size of the problem. It has a large unit cell. There was room for 20 copies in the asymmetric unit. Uh, and it has systematically weak intensities that come both from anisotropy and from translational NCS. So the anisotropy, we um, often describe in terms of the anisotropic delta B. So what is the difference between the B factor in the strongest diffracting direction of the crystal and the weakest diffracting direction of the crystal? And our kind of rule of thumb is if it's more than 30, it's significant anisotropy, and a number over 200 is really exceptionally large. What that translates into in terms of actual intensity values is that at the resolution limit of 2.8 angstroms, the reflections in the strong direction are expected to be something like 450,000 times as intense as the ones in the weakest direction. So you kind of have to account for that. And the translational NCS uh, adds an extra complicating factor where there's a Patterson peak that's 36% uh, of the origin peak. So we can uh, f use this new intensity uh, filter to filter uh, on expected information content and if we use this default threshold of 0 0.01 bits. That removes 19% of the data. And uh, if you remove those 19% of the data, the structure solution is straightforward, just proceeds, and you end up with 16 copies in the asymmetric unit that are arranged as four tetramers. One pair of tetramers is related to the other one by that translational non-crystallographic symmetry. Uh, the, Actually, the reason that we couldn't solve it at first was uh, because there was actually a bug in phaser, an error in, there was one term missing from uh, the fast rotation function to account for the effect of measurement error. And it only became a problem when you had really, really uh, weak in intensities. So now that that bug has been fixed, you, can, you don't have to filter the data in phaser. You will still get a solution. It will take longer because you're, using these uh, one-fifth of the data that contribute absolutely nothing except CPU time. Okay, the, the effect of the information sil filter is that we don't lose any signal from the full data set, it's faster. And there are some potential numerical problems with dealing with uh, very, very noisy data. Um, now, of course, the idea of filtering your data to get rid of the weak intensities is not new. Uh, there are anisotropy servers that will filter your data um, to get rid of the weakest uh, reflections. We think the, uh, there are a couple of advantages of the information filtering approach. Uh, the really big one is that this is actually targeting the specific observations where it doesn't matter in the likelihood calculation. If you do the likelihood calculation correctly, it doesn't matter whether you include these or not, so you might as well leave them out. If you have a method like our little bug that was in phaser, or as I'll show you, if you're using the French and Wilson target in, um, for uh, refinement, um, you are better off throwing it away because if, because if you're not treating the measurement error correctly, it will make the calculation depend on those reflections that they shouldn't depend on. So information uh, targets those specifically, and it's based on individual observations, not overall trends. Uh, one thing I'd like to recommend is whatever you do to truncate your data, keep all of the data and deposit at the PDB something that hasn't been massaged. Uh, different programs might use different amounts of that data properly, and Phaser should be given all the data. There's a new feature in Phaser TNG to do these uh, calculations. So that'll be released fairly soon. And here's an example of uh, how uh, this approach differs to what you would get from Star and ISO, which is one of the, which is a very nice server for doing um, anisotropic, um, anisotropic filtering. Uh, 
one thing is that our information filter tends to be a bit more forgiving and we include more data. You could change the thresholds in star and ISO and get more data as well, probably. Uh, if we zoom in, then you see that uh, because of the TNCS, there are weak and strong reflections. And at this boundary between the well-measured data and the data that you want to throw away, there's an alternation between reflections that are either kept or thrown away. So we, it's uh, targeting at the individual observations. Okay, why does this matter? Well, here is an example of how the log likelihood gain on intensity target should vary as you change the calculated intensity when you have a very weakly measured reflection. So here's a reflection with 0 0.01 bit of information. The likelihood should vary in the third decimal place as you change the model. On the other hand, if you uh, changing the scale here, if you use the RICE target that's used in all modern refinement programs with French and Wilson amplitudes, uh, that target looks, makes it look like uh, the likelihood target changes significantly as you change the calculated intensity. Um, if we go to less extreme examples, something with 0 0.1 bit of information, you can see there is some variation in the LLGI target, but what you'd lose by leaving that reflection out is less than you would uh, lose by uh, including it in the French and Wilson target because these errors are bigger than what you'd be leaving out. As you go to more information content, things change. So uh, Rob Erfner's been doing some tests and sort of agrees with this, that if you're doing refinement on data sets with uh, very weak data, a cutoff somewhere in the range of 0 0.1 to 1 bit is, it gives you the best results in paired refinements. Of course, the best solution would be uh, to use the LLGI target for refinement and account for it, the errors properly. Okay. So I'd just like to give some acknowledgments here. This all involves the members of the uh, phaser team. Uh, didn't talk about this too much, but IRA has been helping to find the data sets uh, to do the Rob's test calculations in by finding things with large um, TNCS effects. And then I mentioned Rob, 20, the people who contributed the Rob 27A data. And thank you for your attention.